again. It's over. He's done it again. Unbelievable. Oh, oh straight into the roof of the net. Nice one. Straight down the middle. So a good performance. Hello and welcome to First Sports. I'm Rupa Ramani. Let's get started. There's an exclusive interview heading your way. Sanjay Manjrekar talks about T20 League and his picks for the best batters, bowlers, teams and captains so far. Who've impressed him the most and much more. But also on the show, Real Madrid's stunning win over Manchester City. It all rested on one man in the end, Rudiger, who was booed to no end at Etihad, yet managed to hold his nerve. What a lesson in grit. And what is the latest controversy that Paris Olympics now finds itself mired in. But first, Sports 360. We'll start with tennis. Former world number one Rafael Nadal has crashed out of the Barcelona Open. He lost 5-7-1-6 to Australia's Alex de Munoz in the second round. Nadal will now prepare for the French Open, where he's been a 14-time champion. Over in cricket and India's T20 league, Delhi beat Gujarat tight by six wickets in Ahmedabad. The Shubman Gill led Gujarat side batting first, posted a shocking 89-run total on the board. It's the lowest first inning score in this season, but Delhi reached comfortably within nine overs. In football, Arsenal have been knocked out of the Champions League. They lost to Bayern Munich 1-0 in the second leg of the quarterfinals. Joshua Kimmich smashed a header in the 63rd minute for Bayern. The result meant Bayern claimed a 3-2 victory on aggregate. Over in basketball, John T. Porter, who plays for the NBA team Toronto Raptors, has been banned for life. America's National Basketball League Association found that Porter disclosed con confidential information about his fitness to sports betting agencies. This incident happened in March during his game against the Sacramento Kings. Porter had claimed that he was ill and only played for three minutes that game. And rounding it up from news at the Ch chess candidates tournament, Ian Nepomniachi defeated Vidit Gujarati. Nepomniachi is now at the top of the points table and because of that, D. Kukesh's draw as well against the world number two, Fabiana Caruano, meant he's in the second spot. All right, we'll kick off with an exclusive heading your way. This season of the league has seen it all. An Indian captain being booed, impact player rule coming under question, young teams emerging as strong contenders for the title, new young stars putting in outstanding performances, Aussie captains ruling the roost and Team India discards delivering. To throw some light on all the hits and misses of the league so far, here's cricket expert Sanjay Manjarekar who joins us. We have to speak about the IPL. You know, it's been quite a few matches in. There have been many closely fought high scoring contests. How do you look back at the tournament so far? What, do you, what are your takers? IPL, see, every edition of the IPL has uh, actually become better and better in the sense in this uh, with regards to appeal uh, the popularity and viewership so on that front uh, it's been brilliant uh, what we now see and obviously that has been the biggest takeaway so far from this ipl is the number of runs scored almost 15 runs and over per innings recently scored so uh, those kind of things are uh, um, you know, which are getting your attention. And the other day we were doing an interview with Ashwin who reads, you know, the game more than just uh, do his job. And he's absolutely right. Every season you see the IPL evolving and in a sense, uh, T20 cricket evolving rapidly. Test cricket took its own time. T20 is like the format is also evolving rapidly. And speaking of evolving, one of the rule changes that really sort of broke uh, a lot of the, the perception and changed IPL was the impact player rule. Uh, it started off very great, but now, of course, uh, teams have started figuring it out. And that sort of created a bit of a, a controversy as well. Many daggers coming out. Where do you stand as far as impact player rule at this point is concerned, Sanjay? See, the fact uh, of T20 cricket when it came into being was the over shrunk to 20 overs per innings but the amount of batters remained the same 
Yeah. So automatically, that was a huge advantage. Bowlers still had a restriction, yeah. you know, of how many overs they could bowl. Uh, with 50 overs, obviously, it was a longer period, but uh, 20 overs and the same amount of wickets. So obviously, there is a little more freedom and license for the batters to, you know, go for the bowling and try and attack from ball number one. So uh, it, is, it has always been skewed in favour of the batters, more so T20 cricket uh, from the other formats. And uh, what we found out is that because the format is so heavily loaded mm -hmm. in favour of a batter, the impact batter is making a greater mm -hmm. impact than an impact bowler. Let's not forget, you get an additional batter as an impact substitute, but you also get an impact bowler as an impact substitute. But because of the format and the general conditions around a match, the impact mm -hmm. batter is making a far greater impact than the impact bowler. So do you see the powers that be sort of going back on this, tweaking this around? Because, like you said, it is queuing the game even further in the favour of the batters. Uh, I don't think uh, fans are complaining. <laughs> there was a gentleman sitting next to me on a flight and he was just, uh, you know, he was so excited with the amount of runs Sunrise the Hyderabad scored. Mm. So um, I, when the fans start getting put off by something, then obviously then you have to have a look at it. Uh, we don't matter. People who are within, um, you know, the uh, former players who played Test cricket, 50 years cricket, and now involved with uh, the IPL. It's really the fans who make the event. So, I mean, different people have different expectations. We constantly talk about balance between bat and ball. That is, that is, as we as former cricketers and who follow, and who have been involved in the cricketing world. Uh, and the game. But if the fans like it, I don't think anything will change too much. Right, but going by all the action that's happened so far, the close contest, the high scoring contest, like we're setting up, which are the teams that you think, or which team that you think you've been most impressed by? Rajasthan Royals. Mm. Uh, just uh, the fact that uh, the first three games, Butler didn't fire, Yashasvi Jaiswal didn't fire, and they still one matches. Sandeep Sharma, you know, somebody uh, who really helped them win the close matches in the first few games that they played. Suddenly, he was unavailable for three matches. Yes. Rajasthan kept winning. There was one game when Butler didn't play, Ashwin didn't play. Yeah. Rajasthan still won. So, it's one of those teams that uh, is not reliant on one or two players. The last game, obviously, Butler single-handedly won them the game. But it's a team that uh, doesn't have a very obvious weakness. With Sandeep Sharma gone, I guess there is some weakness mm. towards the end when Kuldeep Sen bowls. But the team with the least weaknesses, and there's some quality in their batting, in the seam bowling, as well as spin. And very few other teams can boast of this kind of um, a combination. You know, you're speaking of a star batter there in Joss Butler. You know, he reached out and I spoke to so many players who's, who played with him, whether it's Rajasthan, whether it's in England, a lot of the management as well. They all speak about how he's such a down-to-earth, quiet sort of a guy. But I would like to hear your thoughts, your basis, your interaction, especially after that match with him. Uh, my interaction is limited to speaking mm. to them in an official capacity after the game. Yeah. And I try and understand. I mean, I had the uh, privilege of talking to him after that great innings. And he doesn't like to talk about <laughs> himself, which is something that I found out from earlier times. So I put him under pressure saying that you don't like to talk about yourself, but we need to get an insight as to how you are able to play these kind of great IPL innings. He's got, I think, seven IPL 103 have mm -hmm. come in run chases. And the hundreds from memory have always been ones where he stayed there till the end yeah. and won the game for the team almost single-handedly. He's done that on numerous occasions. So, obviously, it's got, it's completely related to the nature of the person, mm -hmm. which in cricketing term we call temperament. Mm -hmm. And that is what separates him from the others. I think he, the kind of skills that he has, the mm -hmm. shots, I think there are quite a few... Uh, batters around in IPL who have the same uh, set of skills and maybe the same kind of ability. Mm. But it's a, it's his temperament that sets him apart. He's one of those few batters who will get 80 runs out of his 100, not really finding the rhythm yeah. and his touch, but he just keeps backing himself. Uh, and in the end, 
is a hit that you know peak and uh, see we see the best of Josh Butler in the last 20 30 runs which the team needs and Butler also needs to get to his 100 so that is where he's pretty unique in the way that he keeps backing himself when he's not playing well while quite a few batters would throw their wickets away and uh, leave it for the others guess which is exactly what he did in that last uh, match for that in that monumental knock that he uh, registered and he played but the T20 League is also not just about the senior hands, they're also about the youngsters who keep coming through. Who are the lot or which of this particular lot has really piqued your interest and uh, have possibly got the selectors thinking as well? I hope uh, because he's not getting as many opportunities, the selectors don't forget about Rinku Singh. Hmm. I think he's a straight-in walk-in in that Indian team. And every time he's got those limited opportunities as well, you see how good he is in the sense, the consistency, the reign that he has. So he's obviously somebody <clears throat> that I like from the, um, obviously the core of the Indian team, uh, from apart from the big names that we always uh, know, you know, that we're thinking about. So he is one. The other batter who has played for India has been around for a long time, but finally I think he's come to a stage where people, what they were expecting is starting to happen. That is Sanju Samson. Uh, with his consistency, maturity, um, and, you know, when he's playing and he's on song, uh, you know, India need that kind of a player in their T20 team. So he's a, another that I really like. Riyan Parag is interesting. I want to see him the whole season because mm. some of the innings that he played, the peak of Riyan Parag, I think very few can match. Very few young batters can match his for a peak, so that is very interesting, but we'd like to see the whole season, how he goes about. But yeah, when I'm looking at uh, players, I'm looking at more T20 batters. I think India might just struggle to get quality T20 seam bowlers. The other thing about this uh, particular edition, uh, Sanjay, is that we've seen so many new captains at the helm of quite a few teams. Who do you think have really sort of found their feet in this particular year? Uh, Shubman Gill, I think, looks very comfortable. Uh, it's not an easy job. Uh, and I like the way that he's just come in and looks like uh, he's uh, um, somebody who seems naturally suited to lead the team. And good to see that it also hasn't affected his batting too much. Uh, again, I have to go back to Sanju Samson. Who would have thought you know, mm -hmm. a few years back that he would sure. be the kind of leader that he is today? Very calm, relaxed. Um, I've not seen enough of uh, Rutharaj Gaikwad hmm. in the sense to know how he is doing because the, the fact will always remain that there is a Mahendra Singh Dhoni right next to him all the time. So when Rutharaj Gaikwad is entirely on his own on the field, hmm. then we can judge him. Um, but uh, I would say Shubman Gill, Sanju Samson have been uh, quite impressive and Pat Cummins how he's leading Sunriser Hyderabad in the uh, sense that he's leading by example and just the amount of commitment that you see from him as a captain has been impressive. Right, time to put you in a bit of a spot. We're at the halfway mark here, pretty much six, seven games at the, at the league. Who are your four teams that are likely to make it for the playoffs? Your pick. This is always like a bit of a wild guess mm. and uh, very often we don't get it right. But um, at this stage, it's easy to back Rajasthan Royals and Kolkata Knight Riders. Mm. Um, I see Mumbai Indians eventually finding a way. TSK Sunrises Hyderabad are the other teams. But I want to stress on this aspect that we always talk about the final four. And in the end, who remembers the final four of the IPS gone by? It's about winning the playoffs and winning on the big night. And that is where you have to look at a team which has players who love the big stage. Mm. And that is where I feel this time around Sunrise the Hyderabad having somebody like a Pat Cummins yeah. and a Travis Head, you might think they have the kind of players that might uh, excel on the big stage. That's where Mumbai Indians also have an advantage. And that's where Rajasthan Royals might be tested and Kolkata Knight Riders as well. So we see CSK obviously have always had that temper with, with MSR. 
All right, catch the entire interview where Sanjay Manjrekar speaks also about the T20 World Cup, the key selections ahead of that. Who is his first choice for wicketkeeper batter? Who should open? Should Virat Kohli lead the charge at the T20 World Cup? What of Hardik Pandya? All of that and more this weekend, Saturday at 2 p.m. Here's the thing about rivalry. The more bitter it is, the better it is for the players, the fans, the viewers, spectators, broadcasters and of course us here who watch and decode sporting action. And it was a very, very bitter face-off that we witnessed last night at the Champions League quarterfinals when Real Madrid took on Manchester City. A contest with a lot of intensity and drama and why not? A semi-final spot was up for grabs and Real Madrid silenced a sizable section of loud, boisterous fans last night, displaying their resilience and grit on the field. It was draining, physically wrought and had and a mad game that was hard for both sides, a fact that Pep Guardiola acknowledged. I would have preferred to win. First of all, congratulations to Real Madrid to reach the semi-finals. They defend so deep with incredible solidarity. So uh, we did everything. I don't have absolutely any regret about what we have done. So. Always we try as a managers and so create more and concede less in every single game because we believe that uh, that helps to be close to win and we did everything. So defensively, offensively, they make a, a good a good goal. So one, two, three or four transition, but it is normal in that level and the quality they have. But uh, we play exceptional in all departments and everything. And unfortunately, we could not win. So that's where it is. Real Madrid versus Manchester City, it's a battle that's steeped in history. After the first leg, Madrid and City were level on three goals each and very little really separated the two sides. But going into the decisive second leg, Madrid knew they had a difficult ask. Etihad, not exactly a rosy setting for Madrid. They've had no wins in their last five outings there. So a daunting task was awaiting them and they were going to face a master tactic tactician in Pep Guardiola. It was really City's game to lose, but you couldn't rule out the Spanish giants to not put up a fight. Rodrigo scored in the 12th minute, in fact, to put City on the back foot. And in fact, that set the precedence of pretty much the narrative to follow all through the game. Real Madrid led the play and City played catch up. And here's the kicker, Manchester City's star Erling Haaland was kept quiet all through. The goal-scoring machine that he is had an engine failure. His motor wasn't running, jammed body parts, the Norwegian had a complete meltdown, like he touched something that had turned him into stone. His performance was so poor that Guardiola had to substitute him. And it looked like City will bow out without a fight until Guardiola's trusted man Kevin De Bruyne came into play. De Bruyne capitalised on a poor clearance from Real Madrid centre-back Antonio Rudiger. This was like adding salt to his injury because Rudiger, if you remember, had a challenging night at the Etihad because he was, and he was constantly booed and jeered by the Manchester City fans, especially the Etihad faithfuls, were targeting Rudiger for what happened back in 2021 at the Champions League final. Rudiger, while playing for Chelsea, tackled Kevin De Bruyne. This injured him and the Belgian walked off the field. End result, Manchester City lost the Champions League title to Chelsea. Man City fans were only reminding Rudiger they hadn't forgotten and they still quite remember that. And after De Bruyne scored the goal, the jeers only got louder. The pressure even more immense on Rudiger. The atmosphere was hostile, making it so much more difficult for Real Madrid and the German Rudiger. The game was now in favour of Manchester City again. They needed just one goal to seal the victory. It was down to penalties. Rudiger stepped up to take it. All scores level. It was Rudiger in the end that scored the winning penalty for Madrid. You could see it unfold with so much drama. The crowd booing Rudiger, a nervous Rudiger before the last shot. And he netted the goal, silencing an entire stadium. And teammates rushed in to envelop him in what was a miraculous moment. From being a villain to a hero, for Real Madrid in seconds. Rudiger was the difference between the two sides on the night. He became the reason for Madrid's success. Real Madrid's victory, in fact, sets up an exciting semi-final clash. A warning sign for their opponents, Bayern Munich. Munich may have gone past Arsenal, but getting past this Real Madrid side would take some doing. Paris Olympics has been in the news for all the wrong reasons. And of course, 
from the health hazards at River Sign that is supposed to host some of the events to, to security threats looming large to opening ceremony possibly being shifted. Paris authorities also coming under the scanner for taking decisions that may be cleaning up the city, but so horribly wrong for the optics of the right kind of governance, all in an attempt to rustle up the best games possible. Amidst all that comes the announcement that gold medalists in the track and field events would be awarded prize money for the first time ever starting this games. A path-breaking change to an age-old norm. A move now that has stirred up quite a storm. From other federations to former Olympians questioning this decision, even claiming that this will only damage the image of the Olympics. The sporting world now stands divided. Here's a report. Eighteen ninety-six, the year when the first Olympic Games was organized, hosted in the city of Athens, Greece, and in the hundred and twenty-eight years since its existence, not many changes have been made. Sure, the ceremonies have become more grand, but the tradition and the ethos have remained. The recently concluded Olympic flame ceremony, a reflection of the tradition that continues. One big change that the World Athletics announced recently was in their decision to reward $50,000 as prize money to track and field gold medalists at the Paris Olympics. It's a historic move, a first in the 128 years of Olympics existence. A cash prize has never been given. Sebastian Coe, their president, made the announcement and he believed that the world has changed and said it was time his sport gave more to its stars. Co even said they are planning to give cash prize to silver and bronze medalists from the 2028 Olympics, a move that was hailed by Indian Olympian Neeraj Chopra. अच्छा है ये मतलब कुछ एक अच्छा स्टार्ट लिया है बढ़िया है अभी शायद गोल्ड के लिए ही किया है उन्होंने मतलब जो गोल्ड जीते हैं उसी को उसी के लिए किया है पर काफी सी है जी कुछ तो कुछ ऐड किया है और वर्ल्ड एथलेटिक्स काफी एक्टिव तो हो रहा है अभी देखो बाकी चीजें भी शायद काफी अच्छी रहेंगी बाकी के जो कॉम्पिटिशन है जैसे डायमंड लीग या कॉन्टिनेंटल टूर है या वर्ल्ड एथलेटिक्स जो चैंपियनशिप होती है शायद उसमें भी धीरे धीरे ये चीजें ऐड होंगी the defending Olympic champion in Javelin would of course welcome this move. So too would the many athletes who will benefit here on because of this landmark decision. But one of the repercussions of this has been other athletes questioning why they did not get the incentive. British swimmer Tom Dean has urged swimming federations to take inspiration from world athletics. When I tell people that we don't receive any prize money from winning Olympic gold medals, that is always a shock and a surprise to everyone. I think it is quite tough when someone has been doing track and field, who has worked just as hard as you for just as many years, is getting this financial reward for winning medals. It's pretty obvious contrast. The move though has faced criticism from former players and leaders from other disciplines. UCI President David Lepartain reckons the move goes against the spirit of the Olympics. We really believe that this is not the Olympic spirit. The Olympic spirit is to share revenues and have more athletes compete worldwide. If we concentrate money on top athletes, a lot of opportunities will disappear for athletes all over the world. I would appreciate if we had the discussion between us. This decision impacts not only athletes, it has other implications. This is not the only voice critiquing the decision. Former British rower Kath Bishop has joined the voices of concern. The Olympian says it will damage the Olympics. In a column, she says, I'm all for moving sport forward, increasing its positive social impact, empowering and valuing our athletes more. Will a cash prize improve the performance we see at the Olympics? I don't think so. To suggest otherwise would insult any Olympian. It's fair to say that the Olympic philosophy is not in a good shape. Strong words there that's getting everyone to think. Making radical changes to an age-old system is always great. Change eventually is unstoppable. But the seemingly altruistic move by World Athletics has opened a can of worms, a controversy that is only gathering more momentum with each passing day. Time for last serve. We're ending on a rather different note. Now, a loss, yes, is heartbreaking, but it also means to stay motivated for what lies ahead. 
The biggest example is that of Rafael Nadal. He never really gives up. In a tearful and emotional press conference right after that loss at Barcelona Open, he spoke about he, how he just wanted to see how far he could go before he collapsed and never giving up and looking forward to the French Open. I think I, I was able to to show myself, most important, and the rest of the world <laughs> to show myself that uh, uh, when I was really trying at a high percentage of intensity, uh, my level was there to compete. And I feel myself that if I am able to keep practicing days on the tour and I'm able to, to if my body allows me to, to spend hours on court and uh, have the practices the way that I need, I hope to be competitive. That's that's true, and I hope and I really believe I can be competitive in a few weeks. My final goal is myself to give me a chance to to be ready at least to compete in in Roland Garros. That wraps it up here on First Sports. Thanks so much for joining in. I'll see you again tomorrow. Till then, goodbye.